Um, and we got to a point where on the left-hand side was like a pit of fire, but in the in that fire were humans, but not humans. Um, I, I, I would explain them as humanoids um, because they were like a human but really stretched out, if that makes sense, so really elongated. Um, and their faces were really distorted and they were reaching out like this at me. And um, so I, I instantly got afraid. Rhonda, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm very intrigued by your story. And I think that a lot of our viewers would be intrigued as well because yours is a little bit different than some of those we've had. So I'm just going to hand over the floor to you and you could just share a little bit about what happened and what led you to where you are today. Okay. Um, so um, when I was around five years of age, um, I had a dream um, that I went to heaven so that's in brief. Um, so ha what happened was the m most I remember is I don't remember the angel meeting the angel. I've got the vaguest, vaguest memory of that. But um, the thing that I remember the most is the angel work walking on my right side and then I was in like a corridor, like there was a wall there, but you're an invisible wall, so to speak. Um, I don't know how else to explain that. Um, and we got to a point where on the left-hand side was like a pit of fire, but in the in that fire were humans, but not humans. Um, I, I, I would explain them as humanoids um, because they were like a human but really stretched out, if that makes sense, so really elongated. Um, and their faces were really distorted and they were reaching out like this at me. And um, so I, I instantly got afraid. Um, and the angel on the right-hand side of me said to me, don't be afraid, just look straight ahead. And as soon as I did that, all I focused on was these massive doors. Um, and they, the way to explain these doors is they didn't end either way or upwards either. Um, and they just opened up and they were like a really dark timber mixed with gold. So it's not a material that I've ever seen on, on earth. Um, and and when they, when they opened, um, the angel and myself went through and it was like a little pathway um, and the angel, I instantly got afraid because I saw like lions and tigers, um, animals that I would be afraid of because we don't have them here. Um, so um, I'd be really, yeah, really afraid of them. And so I was. And the angel said again, don't be afraid. And as soon as she said that, I instantly was not afraid. And the animal stopped, looked at, because they all stopped and looked at me. And I think that's what caused a bit of fear as well. Um, and then they just went back down and laid back down on the on the really greenest of green grass. Um, and then the angel wasn't there anymore and I was there alone. Um, and the pathway um, went straight ahead and then it, um, it, t it was a T-section. And so you could either go left or right. Um, I chose to go right um, for the reason that I saw a big waterfall um, where you could see it coming down but you couldn't see where it started, um, which intrigued me. Um, and then I could see like where it just went along like a stream and then it went down and that's the bit that really intrigued me. So I had to go and look and um, it was like a magnet for me. <laughs> I just had to look. And I looked down and all I could think was, where does it end? You know, it doesn't end. That can't be right. And then I felt uh, a presence behind me and um, the way to explain that is it was instant, unconditional love and like a magnet. And so, like, I was drawn to this 
like I was had a magnet on me and I was drawn to this up the pathway uh, I went again and um, it was a, a really bright light um, not hurting the eyes it's really hard to explain maybe like a like a, sort of like a torch light in the distance if that was shining on you um, but it was very tall um, and um, you instantly felt Pure, pure love, unconditional love, nothing more, nothing less. So for me, there was no judgment. There was no, it just can't mix with what I, with who I met. I knew it was God straight away. Um, and like, just like I knew who the angel was, like a female, I knew the angel was a female and older than my mum. My mum was 25. Um, so I sort of thought it would be older than my mum. and um, But no one I knew. It wasn't anybody I knew. It wasn't a relative. I didn't see any relatives. I didn't really know of any relatives that had passed either. Um, so, yeah, meeting God um, was just like meeting unconditional love and you really, really felt at home, like your home. And God said to me, you need to go back. It's not your time. And I was really, I was really upset about that. And so I said no, because um, I really loved where I was, and um, I wanted to go down the the rest of the pathway, but God was stopping me from because He was like a magnet. <laughs> um, so, and so I said no. And about th so He asked me probably three times, and I kept saying no. And then He said, "What about your family?" And as soon as God said that, I instantly thought of my family, um, which I sort of hadn't given any thought to while I was there. Um, and I, and he said, your family needs you. So I thought, oh, well, okay, well, I better go back. So as soon as I thought that, I was back in my bed. Um, and I woke up the next morning and I told my mother. And she, she, um, she said that, oh, it was just a dream. Um, but I, I spoke to her a bit more and when she became a Christian, she said, oh, you actually went to heaven because um, I kept talking about it with her. I just I kept saying, well, I can't get, get this dream out of my head. And, and, and since, I, since that dream, I became quite psychic and I, I didn't like it because um, my, I, I mostly had dreams and they were about my own life. And they were never, ever positive. It was sort of like warnings of what was going to happen because I don't think I would have been able to cope had I not had those dreams, pre-warning. So in hindsight, that I think that's what, why I had those dreams. Um, but I, when I walked past people as, as well, I sort of was picking up a lot from them and whether they're sad or whether they're happy, whether, they're, you know, contending in their relationship, all that kind of thing. Um and also there was a lot of just knowing. Um, as an example, when I was, um, I would have been about 11 or 12 and um, the news was on and we were, as kids, there were seven of us children, we were all had to get, leave the room when the news was on. But I stopped because um, they were talking about IVF, in vitro fertilisation, um, and I instantly knew that I would have to go through that. And I was only 11 or 12. So, mm -hmm. and I did. I had to go through IVF um, to have my beautiful daughter. Um, and I've got two beautiful grandsons. So having said that, I went through my team. Uh, uh, when my parents started going to church, I did as well. And... Um, I really, really got myself really involved for the reason that I'd met God and I really needed to clarify and verify all of that in my own mind. Um, but nothing sort of stuck right. And because I feel that I always, and then I did then, that God that I met was a God of love, unconditional love. And everything in life, is a choice, everything we do. And um, so I sort of thought, and and, because, and then I sort of looked into, they started listening about other religions and 
um, noticing they sort of all had the same thing in, in common. Well, number one, they're all praying and they're all praying to God. And there's only one God because I met God. There was only one there. Um, <laughs> so everyone's praying to the same God, with it, whether they realise or not. Um, so um, later on in life, I... I didn't like how I was psychic and um, I sort of blamed God for it. Um, and and I was sort of a little bit bitter, to be quite honest, because I was looking for that significant moment when my family needed me and it didn't come. So later in life I had my daughter and that took a lot of praying um, and a lot of like, Arr. so like, how could you be so mean to me? You know, and um, even though I knew that I would have to go through IVF. Um, so I, when I had conversations uh, um, with friends and that, I didn't really tell them or involve myself as to what my beliefs were, as so to speak. And then, um, oh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, yes, yeah, so I looked into that and, and then I just, I just, I was so angry with God still. So at 22, um, God came to me and how he came to me was just a knowing, um, a, a really loving voice and knowing. And it's a knowing of what that voice even sounds like, even though you can't physically hear the voice. So I, I would explain that as telepathic. Um so, and God said to me very clearly, um, why do you deny me when you met me? And well, it really hit hard. Mm. So, it, and, and I, I just thought, well, that's so true. How can I? And um, so I, 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 I continued on and sort of found it very hard still to talk about my beliefs and what happened to me and, and all of that. And um, in the meantime, I did speak to my mum. My mum became spiritual um, after going through being a Christian. She looked at lots of different religions and she became spiritual and and I found that that was the same road I was going on even though I was like miles apart from my mother. Um, so my mum's quite psychic, by the way, too. Um, and so um, I forgot yeah, and, yeah, and then I years went on, and I didn't, I, I still didn't have my answer to when my family needs me, and I'd been diagnosed at that point with a heart condition, a very rare heart condition um, that I was born with, apparently. So my heart stops; it doesn't anymore. I've got a pacemaker. <laughs> um, but my heart was stopping all the time, mostly in my sleep. But when it really stopped, I would pass out and sometimes go blue. And I've never seen myself, so that's good. <laughs> um, so that's happened to me many, many times, probably in the thousands. Um, but my, I, I ended up finding really, really good cardiologists. Um, so the first cardiologist that was on the right track with me, I blurted out to him, oh, I, ha I, went, I had a dream, I went to heaven. And rah, 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 and a little bit of what I saw, just briefed him. And he turned around and he said, oh, yeah, you had a near-death experience. Like it was just like having a cup of coffee. It was just like, oh. I was like, oh, I really did. And so about a week or two later, I'm watching TV and, and a documentary came on and it was about NDEs. And so I listened and, yeah, my story wasn't quite like it, so I... I still sort of wondered, you know, and queried God. and But by the, you know, years went on and I started to really, really embrace God and and, and talk to him like he's my best friend. Um, so one day I'm laying out in the sun a couple of years back and I said, I, I just said, you said my family needed me, but they, they don't. So what's the go there? And, yeah. you know, I've only got a few years left to, to go, so why would you just leave me in this kind of misery? And he said very clear to, clearly, he said, what about your daughter? And I went, oh, right, yes, because this could be, she could have, get what I've got, 
She may not, but she could. And her sons may get it. And I don't want them to go through what I've been through, so I want a cure. <laughs> and I believe the cardiologists I have today can do that. And I believe that's what God was saying. Through me, could save my daughter or my grandsons. Wow. Because I'm a bit of a guinea pig, <laughs> so, which is really, really good. Yeah. 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 I just need to have some, sorry. So let's just go back. The, when you were five, do you think that was a near-death experience? Do you think maybe it was also your heart condition, that your heart stopped and um, that is what yeah. happened? Yes. Yeah, 100%. 100% because I could never, ever get rid of the dream out of my head, and I've had many. And when I um, I decided to embrace my psychic ability and um, the ability to speak to the other side um, because when I was told I couldn't work anymore, I thought, what am I going to do with my time? I worked 70-hour weeks, so it was like a big slap in the face. Mind you, I said, I'll show you. I just changed my career, but that... That didn't work out very, very fast. Um, so due to my heart condition. Um, so um, sorry, the question. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, so you, so you think that the, that, that near-death experience was because of your heart? Yes, yes, because um, I found out that my heart stops a lot through the night while I'm asleep. Um, oh. And when I found that out, I, I realised that that cardiologist that first um, started to diagnose me um, was on the right track and and my he knew my heart was stopping. Um, so, um, and, and what I didn't know was it was through the night a lot until I spent two weeks in coronary and it was stopping. I was had nurses rushing. Oh, I couldn't tell you how many times in the night. Um, yeah. So, is that, genetic? Um, is that yeah, a genetic disease? I, I, well, I believe so. For the reason that both parents had. Well, my dad had a massive heart attack. He survived that, and but he ended up passing away from pancreatic. Was it pancreatic cancer? Um, but my mum, she's she's has a heart condition as well. So it's on both sides of the family. So I kind of got everything in one. Um, yeah. What I have is called bradycardia, tachycardia syndrome. Um, so they can control the the dropping of the heartbeat with the pacemaker, um, but they can't control. Well, I'm now on medication for the tachycardia as well, but... Um, they said, they said to me, well, a doctor um, who didn't like to answer the question, but I had to ask him um, due to going on to be, not being able to work and going on to a disability pension, um, I had to ask him um, what my, time, you know, my lifespan was and he didn't want to say anything and then he ended up saying, because uh, I had to pressure him, <laughs> five years from the time you got your pacemaker, which is next year on the 1st of April. Um, I believe I've got a, a little bit longer than that, um, but I am still having a party on that date, um, <laughs> uh, mostly just to celebrate um, the fact that I am still here because um, I know that my time's not up yet because there's still things that I need to do um so you'll see down the track um what they are um but there's some things i really need to do and um so i started on facebook doing free readings um when i couldn't work anymore um mm -hmm. for the reason that uh when i couldn't work anymore i went from an income up there to an income right down there so overnight um and so that's a lot to deal with and 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 so financially, it's like a big slap in the face, so to speak. Um, and people go through that every single day. And yeah. there's people who really who need to speak to a relative or friend from the other side or they, they need guidance or they need, uh, you know, a future kind of reading, whatever type of reading it might be. Um, and I thought, well, why don't I just do that and give of my time to these people? 
Um, and I do that when I'm well. I'm not always well and I always feel really guilty because when I'm not well because I really want to do these readings but I know it's going to knock me even further back so I have yeah. to hold off. Um, so this and, and I, I, I've had a lot of operations over the last few years um, which knocks me as well. Um, so but I know my time's not up. Like last operation a couple of weeks ago, my heart rate went up to 180 while I was under um, so obviously my cardiologist had to be called in. So I live in a country city, um, but they can't, they won't and can't do operations on me um, due to the fact um, of my heart. Um, it needs to be where my two cardiologists work out of. Um, so I went down to Sydney, which is the big city of New South Wales. Yeah. <laughs> um, <where's the> <laughs> um, yeah. So... Yeah, yeah, so I, I go down there, which is what I call my second home um, because I'm also an outpatient there as well for pain clinic and all the other things that I've got to go there for. Um, so I stay in the hostel, in the hospital a, a lot. And um, so it's like my second home. And, yeah, so that's that's good. Yeah, but I really um, I, I really have a lot of faith in my cardiologists Um probably more than they realise they do than themselves, you know, like they, I think they're not, yeah, I, I give them all the all the credit. Um, number yeah. one, I wouldn't be here without them because they had to build a pacemaker for me. Um, and now they've got this, in that, and a special device called a CLS Active is sitting on top of it and it goes to a device that looks like the telephone. And that then goes through to my cardiologist after it downloads off me. So they can see what's going on every day with my heart if necessary. Um, and um, so I do think that with that, um, they'll be able to come up with some kind of cure. Yeah. Well, so so the, the brachycardia tachycardia is the brachycardia is that where it stops and the tachycardia is where it goes uh, out of rhythm is that what it is yeah. it goes out of rhythm and really really fast fast uh, yeah yeah so really would that be fast. from like anxiety when people have anxiety they have that kind Some of people get that experience. from anxiety yeah and most people get high um yeah they, that from anxiety but mine i got t-boned in a car not so long a few oh, almost a year ago actually and it was since then I'm spending more time in tachycardia. Um, okay. So my heart's doing something my cardiologist haven't seen before and it's staying there. Um, and I, yeah, so there's not much they can really do other than put me on this medication and they'll see whether it's the right amount and, and just trial. So, um, but they're always on the right track. So, but the, they did say when I got excited about the pacemaker, oh, it's not a cure. Um, it's like, oh. Um, <laughs> um, so it's just keep me alive for a little bit longer. So, um, and I'm really grateful for that. But like I said, when your time's up, it's up. And when it's not, it's not. Um, look, I've had a, a massive big branch come down on my car doing 100 kilometres per hour in front of my yeah. face. It should have come through and decapitated me. It didn't. It bounced out and bounced over the top of the car. Um, that was an absolute miracle. And everybody involved with, like, the police and the tow truck or whoever it was, every single one of them said, that's a miracle that you yeah. hear. Um, and, I, and I know that because when your time's up, it's not. It is, but it's not when it's not. You know, no, I so agree with when you. I, it's yeah. when it's your time, it's your time. There's no point worrying about it because if it's meant to be, it's going to happen anyway. And and you already yeah, know exactly. what's on the other side. So you know that that's okay too. Absolutely. Um, and also I'll just say about my dad since he passed, and he, he did a lot of things when he first passed, as in um, come and watch his favourite show on my TV in my bedroom that was not plugged into an aerial um and he watched mash um <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. every, he watched it every single day when he was alive and he started doing it on my tv and i was like yeah radio take over my bed just lay there and watch it <laughs> and then one day i Sweet. said yeah i 
said, oh, can I watch um, such and such on another channel? And I waited a moment. So then I flicked and, yeah, sure enough, he let me watch it. Um, but one time I went to watch it again, but MASH, he kept going back to MASH, probably because he was like, no, no, I can't miss another episode because he would have been like that in real life as well. Um, but after that, I knew when I saw A Psychic on Facebook that my dad was going to come through him. I just knew. And so I waited and waited and um, another person came through for me and I was like, oh, that was out of the ordinary. And it was sort of out of the ordinary who it was as well. It wasn't my dad either. and But I still knew that my dad was going to come through him. And I didn't know how or when, or but I just waited and waited. And one morning I got up and I looked at Facebook and I never, ever, ever just go straight to my phone because I worked with the phone every day and I was like, oh, no. So, but this one morning I did and I saw that this psychic was coming to Kofsaba near where I lived and I thought, oh, I've got a book. Yeah, I'm going. I've got it. Yep. So I booked the ticket and I rang my sister and, and took about three or four phone calls to convince her to come with me. It was a six-hour drive for her to come. Um and I kept saying, I promise you, my dad's going to come through. Our dad is going to come through. And sure enough, um, he was about the second person, I think, to come through um, with a whole heap of relatives. And the last thing my dad said, which stood out to both of us, was, um, I'm waiting to show you around soon. And my sister clung to the word soon. My mum says spiritual soon can be years, but... You know, we don't know what it is. And the reason my dad said that, and I knew why he said that whole sentence, was because when he was on his deathbed, um, I saw the fear in his eyes because um, it was like he didn't know where he was going. And he was a born-again Christian. And I'm thinking, I thought all the born-again Christians knew where they were going. And um, so I said to Dad, you know, when I was a child and I said I went to heaven, he sort of just looked at me and gave me a little nod. And I said, well, it really did happen. And you're going to a beautiful, beautiful place. You're never want to go, going to want to come back here. And um, anyway, so he just stared at me and didn't say anything back. But his sense of humour is that, look, I've been to, I'm in heaven and I've seen it all. You only saw a little tiny bit of it. <laughs> I'll show you yeah. around. So that's my dad's sense of humour. Like he told me he went to heaven and I know that he did and he only saw this tiny little bit, which I did only see a tiny bit. In my mind it was like down, down that pathway I didn't get to go was where every, all the action was. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I've lost a lot of friends recently as well and I look forward to surfing with them in heaven <laughs> so I know they're so, all up there mm. you know I mean well, the question is how many people how many times has somebody had an illness where doctors diagnose them and they've lived way past that time you know for me I almost That's feel right. like once somebody's declared it even if I went to a psychic if they had to tell me when I'm going to yeah. die I would I would be very hesitant to want to yes. hear anything else that they say because it's almost like a death sentence. Well, and then you may be... No, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. No, that's right. They never should, yes. Um, no, but my dad no. was in a, in a place where he didn't have a choice and he didn't want to answer and he said, I could be wrong. Um, when I Googled it, it was 10 years. So yeah. I've, in my mind I've got 10 years. But I look at the wires. It's all about the wires. The, um, the heart has three wires mm -hmm. um, that shoot for the heart to go. It's the electrics. And, and um, so one of them couldn't be replaced and two could be. But okay. they, they, they jam up and they don't fire. So um, right at the last moment they would do another electrophysiology study, which is shooting... Um, um, like shooting a fire, like shooting a little bar up there and um, trying to get it to fire. Um, so, yeah, 
I know what, you know, and I look at how long they say, um, which I look, I read the medical reports, um, mm. how long they say my wires have left because I don't think they can replace them once they die. That'll be that. that yeah. So that's my thoughts. I could be wrong. My other, my cardiologist, that was a GP that I don't see anymore, um, only due to um, relocating. Um, he was also a really good doctor, so he didn't really want to, he did not want to answer. I, ha I was going through tribunal um, to, to get the disability pension um, because of the rarity of my heart that I had to fight yeah. to get it. And so he was put on a spot because they wanted an answer. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm just curious about that. I, I wouldn't say it's wrong. I just think he can't really know no. either. So no, it's like... <laughs> and he did say that. He did say that, So, which yeah. I thought was really... Um, he said, only God knows. I said, yeah, I know, but I really, I have to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think even psychics don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've, um, I've only ever seen one death in a reading and... I couldn't tell the person. I won't say too much about it, but it was a, um, it wasn't a human. It was um, a pet. Okay. So um, I'll just say, like, I'll just say that. Um, and I didn't let her know. And I always felt guilty because I think she was angry with me for not letting her know. Um, but the, the rule is that you don't, if you do see that, um, you don't ever, ever tell yeah. them um, because it, it, we're not God. We are not God. And I've never seen a, had a reading, and I've done many. I've been doing it um, now for about oh, 20 years. Um, and so, like, with family and friends and for years before I started my page and group and, um, and then so... I would never, ever, ever come out. But like I said, it's only ever happened once. And that yeah. was many years back, many, many years ago. So yeah. um, I, I would never read it that way because usually the death card doesn't mean death. It means yeah. change. It, it's a change or it's a transition um, of some type. So yeah. not, not, not actually death of the body. Yeah, so it could be belief systems or, yeah. Exactly. So that card can never mean death, yeah. so to speak, as in we're dying and that's it. That card can never mean that. So yeah. other than that one time with an animal, <laughs> um, I can't explain that, but I, I was probably meant to pre-warn her. Um, but I didn't follow that. and But I do now. I had a dream in when I was working and of a colleague going to a football match and it'd been raining and he was in his car and he was went to show off taking off on the grass and he rolls it and it was fatal. So I rang him the next morning and I said, oh, Tim, you're not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell you anyway um, and I'm really concerned. And he asked me, if, I didn't say it was fatal, but um, he said, was it fatal? And I said, yes, it was. So he rings me over the weekend. He said, if I'd gone, it was raining. Um, and probably exactly what you said would have happened. So I thank you very much for warning me. So he yeah. didn't go because it was raining. Yeah. So, yeah, like you say, it's a precognition so that you've got a chance to do something about it. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah, and that's because we always have a choice. That's it. That's what it's all about. If you get a reading, that's what it's about. It, um, it's it's just the path you're on at the moment, or um, this is showing you a way that you can be, or you know, down, you know, you know. So this is a door opening up for you this way. Um, yeah, it's that, it's that's what it's about when you get a reading. Um, it shouldn't be anything negative, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, you say you became psychic after your your near death experience, but do you think you already had it and it just kind of opened it up more for you? 
And do you think you had a download? Does it feel like something happened while you were there that kind of opened you up more for it? Because I've heard that from a lot of people now. Yeah. Yeah, I think we get it from the unconditional love that we feel. Um, I think it's something that, that not many people really understand about unconditional love. And I feel like I, I get it totally. And okay. I think it was from that moment I just knew, I understand what it's all about. Um, yeah, so it's it's just, yes, you forgive. You forgive. You know what? Because bitterness only eats away at you. You know, it yeah. doesn't eat away at the person that you're bitter about. So yeah. forgive. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite interesting because the heart is about love. Yeah. And yet, you yeah. you know, you've experienced this and then you've got a heart condition because I find, yeah. you know, from all the, the learning that I've done and, and my own experiences, a lot of um, physical illness is a result of some trauma that happened and something that's being stopped. It's like the energy's not getting there. That is why the heart's mm-hmm. not even going. So, and that could be genetic. It could be something that happened down the line in the family. How far back do you know that that genetics goes? Because if your mom yeah. has it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it's, um, yeah, we don't know. And you're exactly right. And But what I find interesting is a lot of psychics, you might have said this, um, also that, after they've had their experience, like with God or, you know, going have, have an NDE, they, yeah. like you, uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm so sorry. No, I was just <laughs> saying how far back it goes, your, um, genetically, how far back when that trauma started. Because if you can trace it back yeah. to where it started and you heal that trauma, it can like, kind of filter down and it won't yeah. only heal you but also your children. Yes, yes, and I think that um, that's a really interesting thing um, and to find where it starts is the hardest part, I think, um, because like you say, it can be so far back in, in genetics. Correct, so, but it's in you. But it is in me. you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I find a lot of psychics also, they get a lot of, they, they seem to get an illness, a serious illness. Yes, and, it's weird, and yeah, it is strange. If I don't, if you notice that, um, but it's something I've noticed, and um, um, I, I don't know whether that's to open you up more to to the other side. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, like we don't have all the answers, but we're not meant to either. <laughs> so. <laughs> No, I agree with you. I just, I find like, for me, I haven't been able to smell for about three years now. And it's very frustrating because I can't really taste much. It's very, very limiting. And I don't know if something's burnt. I don't know if something's off. So I could eat something and, you know, get a reaction, but nothing that I can do about it. But um, with what you were saying, um, so you would read Fiona Hayes' books? Um, Louise, hey, the, the, oh, your body speaks your mind. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah so I thought you might have. <laughs> yeah. Because with what you were saying, so with, when it goes back, so can we use like Louise Hay's book yep. and go, right, that's what caused it? Well, they say it's called anosmia and, um, it's what is it that you don't, what are you not taking in? Mm. So I don't know. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I was just <laughs> many things. Yeah. yeah, but I think everything in life's a learning thing too about ourselves. Um and what makes us happy. We're all after that. And I think once oh, yes. we learn, you know, unconditional love. And I saw an old lady on Facebook today, and 103, and she said, 
Um, all the the secrets to life start with L. And she said love, life, and I didn't get to watch the rest of them. But um, um, but she went through them and she said there's five L's. Okay. So I find that really interesting. And she's 103 and she was a doctor. So, um, yeah, so she seems to have the secret. Laughter is another one. Um, yeah, so I, all of them I just thought, oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah, true. Oh, Everybody's it? looking for happiness. And to me, yeah. happiness is a choice. I've seen people yes. that are happy through the most miserable circumstances. They shouldn't be smiling. Yeah. And um, some people are just miserable for the sake of it, the, you know, lashing out at everyone, and they just make everyone miserable. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's due to a lot of business in the heart, you know, and, um, and not being able to let go of that. Um, because yeah. if you can let go of that, then you're going to feel better within yourself. You're not going to be so angry and upset and agitated. And yeah. um, and just I think one of the secrets is just to love everybody unconditionally. Um, yeah. Of course, we're never going to achieve that in our lifetime on this planet, but we can all try. <laughs> so, <I> feel, <laughs> it's hard. Yes. <laughs> It's hard. You know what I find? When you're with somebody who's negative, you could send them love, but if they really impact on you and they manage to get into your energy and drain you, it's very hard to be loving when you're not even loving yourself. When you absolutely. get into that point where you're feeling attacked and shut down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And I've experienced that throughout my life quite a few times. And um, I think the only so yeah, that's when you sort of have to reach out to God and say, "Okay, God, you're the only person who can drag me out of this hole." I was actually saying that with someone uh, the other day is that when you uh, a lot of people, if they haven't been through trauma themselves, they don't really wake up to something else bigger than them. So it's kind of yeah. like that inner journey that you take. But if they don't, um. If you haven't experienced the kind of trauma that you've had or you haven't been through all these situations where you're dying and you're having the pain and, and nobody can help you, because nobody can. They don't know. There's something bigger at stake. It causes you to want to look outside of yourself. So, yeah, yeah. it's unfortunate, but we only kind of grow through trauma and pain. And it's, I know. <laughs> it is it's sad, like a isn't total it? contradiction. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But they say if you don't... If you don't know bad, you don't know good. So yeah. if you have no pain, then you're not going to know pain. You know, yeah. so, you know, we've got to have the opposites. Yeah. I, I suppose hate is the opposite to love, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be a dislike without a hate. Yeah. So yeah, I'd like to well, do like, that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I notice that a lot of people that are, I mean, I work with, uh, with people in toxic relationships or people that are recovering from abuse, but they've all gone that spiritual path because nobody around them can hear them. Nobody understands. Nobody, they're also being gaslit by, the, by their friends and by their family because they're saying, oh, but he's so nice to you. What is your problem? You know, mm -hmm. and, and then they, they realize there is something wrong. You know, it doesn't sit right. It's a knowingness. Like, I, I'm not being treated right. They're not treating me right. Something going on here. And then you do. You reach out somewhere else to a higher power that says, listen, can someone give me some reason here? <laughs> and it's very hard to communicate that to the people around you because they're just not there. They're not looking for it. Yeah, well, it is so true. And I've been through that myself. And um, and when I did call out to God during that time, I was fortunate after my grandmother passed, um, she came to me and she helped me and she helped me escape and, um, and she let me know she'd been through it. Um, so I was, and that's when a lot of doors really did open up to the other side of being able to communicate with the other side it was mostly through my grandmother and yeah. um and that's when i could really i started and my and it opened up with a lot of my siblings as well 
um, because she was appearing to um, a lot of my siblings as well during my time my dad was dying. Um, but prior to that, she had come to me and helped me get away. And honestly, I would find that hard to tell many people because they go, oh, what a ghost helped you. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's <someplace>. right. <laughs> Someone who cares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. So, um, yeah, so I think that God um, does send people and they don't have to be from here. Yeah. They can be from the other side to help you. Yeah. Um, and I found that really interesting and it went on for some time where Grandma wouldn't leave me and looked after me the uh, uh, during the after time because yeah. I sort of had to, well, tra I had to go through a transition to be able to be back in the normal world. So... Yeah. Um, my grandmother really helped me through all of that and guided me. So I felt really grateful for that. And after that, I had my granddad appear and, um, yeah, just a couple of people from the other side. So that's when I knew that I could actually have conversations with people on the other side and know they're there. Yeah. Um, so that opened up an enormous amount of doors for me, yeah. So if you call them, do they come or do, you, do they only come when they want to? Usually when I call them, they come, but not all of them. Um, some will choose when they want to come and you, they make that known um, that they're going to choose when they're, when they're ready. And sometimes their timing is just not mine. Um, you know, I might be in the shower and, <laughs> and I'm like, not now. And I'm like, <laughs> so I'll have to say back off, you know. So um, it's not like they're looking at you in the shower. It's just like, I'm ready, I'm ready. And that, that's what, what you sort of see yeah. and hearing. It's, I'm ready, I'm ready. And it's like, well, I'm not. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, I do have them where sometimes a lot of people want to come through at once. And, yeah, that's a bit like you you got to prioritise. You've got to say, well, who am I speaking with here? And and other times they don't really make themselves apparent who they are. So I have to figure out who they are. So I don't always. I saw an actual ghost as in like um, he looked human um, not so long ago, um, just up from like I'm on a bit of land. And so I can see through to the, you know, two neighbours away. And I, I, I thought it was a shed he was coming out of. And I was always out in my bikini out in the yard, like trying to clean up the yard. And and he'd always be just standing there watching in his big drench coat, like a bit like Ned Kelly, and <laughs> in a big coat and big beard and just watching me like that, staring. And... The last time I saw him do that, I felt so uncomfortable. I ran inside, but I got a shiver. And I thought, oh, my goodness, it's, he's a ghost. And I thought, no, don't be ridiculous. And um, anyway, the last time I saw him, um, that was the last time I saw him there. The very last time I saw him was I woke up in the middle of the night because I felt a presence in my room and he was standing at the end of my bed just looking down at me. Um, with that same look. I don't know who he was, um, but I went up to the neighbours and she, anyway, she she was saying, oh, the ovaries. And I'm like, oh, that's not a shed? And she's like, no, it's an ovary. I'm like, and I'm looking and I'm like, there's no door. So it's all, like, it's, it's definitely an ovary. And the door was right around the other side to get into the Avery. And so I realised in that moment, definitely I was 100% right that that was a ghost. And I don't know who he was. Maybe Ned Kelly. No, I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. But <laughs> the way he looked at me, I don't know who he was. So I just have a sip of coffee. See, that's interesting with your, with, with your near death. Is, you know, they say that the, there's like a lower realm that surrounds the first the dimension and then you've got to get through that to get to the other side. 
-hmm. and you're walking like, you know, your angel will say, just keep walking because you don't want to get stuck in that lower realm. So all these humanoids that are ploying, do you think they are human or do you think they just kind of represent them, present themselves that way to look as if they're human? I think that's how they present themselves. Um, and I think they're there for a reason. And um, I've had many years to think about it, but I never really told anybody about that part if I did tell my story um, for the reason that I didn't want to scare anyone because a lot it of people go, oh, it's hell, it's hell. But I didn't see it as hell. Um, I saw it at the time as a five-year-old. I just didn't give it any other thought. Um, other than just do as I was told and look straight ahead and don't look that way. And when I didn't look that way, I didn't see it. So yeah. um, I've thought about it and I've thought about it for years and I thought, why did I see that and who were they? What were they? Um, and there's, there's something that I've come up with and I think the thing that I've come up with is it's it, it's they're there for a purpose. I don't think they're... They're human or, or, um, or in hell. I, I see them as God created this, this thing, this pit, so that people like me as a five-year-old or anybody else who fears a fire um, or being in a fire, and I think most people do, um, it's to let go of that fear. So at one, and that's probably you know that's a horror thing to to think that you're going to. That makes sense. That makes sense. So let go of that fear, and then when I went through, and I saw the animals, the wild animals, I I thought, well, I I felt that same kind of fear. It's something that I would feel really fearful of. Um, what if the lion gets up and gets me, you know? So, um, I had to let go of that fear when the angel said, don't fear. And, and it's like you let go of it instantly. And when the angel say, says that, so that was twice for me, the angel said it. So I thought, well, maybe it's to let go of the fear. And once you're in those doors, and like you say, I was only at the very start. And my dad made that very clear too. When he came through, <laughs> I only saw a tiny little wincy bit. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what he's seen, but it's, I know it's a lot more than I have. Um, and I know most people get to see a lot more. I didn't get to see a lot, so I duped. No, just kidding. <laughs> just um, <laughs> um <clears throat> Yeah, so I think that it's to let go of fear because you can't yes. feel unconditional love if you've got fear. Oh. I wonder <laughs> if that's like layer around <laughs> I would say, you know, from a, from a quantum perspective would be like a repository where, where people's fear goes to. It's almost like it's got to go somewhere. Where does that energy go? Mm. Maybe into the pit. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I do cough a lot. Sorry. Yeah, people always think um, other people's lives are easy until you're living it. Yeah, exactly, you do. Unless you start living, yeah, yeah, you have to live it and or live with them to see. Um, because a lot of people live that, you know, learn that way as well with someone who's close by, who live, maybe, they, maybe it's a relative or whoever it might be that they live with, that they can learn from them. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> I'll get asthma. Cardiac asthma. <coughs> <coughs> so what's happening at the moment with my heart is that when it drops down, the pacemaker is supposed to kick in, but it's taking its time to kick okay. in at the moment. So... Um, they can't really change it anymore. They changed it as much as they could. Um, they can't alter it any further. But And so that causes me to cough as well. 
Um, yeah, so because it only takes like, um, to us it's nothing long at all, like two, three seconds um, isn't very long for us, but for the heart it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's hectic. So what about exercise and things like that? Can you, can you, nothing? So, so I need to cover you. <coughs> I've been a surfer most of my life and um, I've always been very fit. Um, and I was riding my push bike to check the surf out and I came home. By the time I got home, I couldn't breathe. Um, so I knew something was seriously wrong. Um, yeah, so I started going downhill a lot. I I realised I was on my deathbed um, when I couldn't surf anymore because I always said, I'll surf until I die. You know, like okay. people stop, you know, when they get to a certain age, you're like, oh, I won't do that. I'm going to surf until I die. You know, so that was always what I always said, um, thinking that would be true. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, I I've, I've haven't surfed for three years now, which absolutely breaks my heart. Um, I'm at the point where I'm only allowed to exercise if I have somebody with me um, or short distance and then be able to sit down. Um, so I've got to cough again. <coughs> <coughs> and then... Um, I'm allowed to do hydrotherapy. Um, so I had a physiologist, but I kept have being injured um, or having operations. So that's been out the door for some oh, 18 months. Um, so I'm waiting to get back into that, and that will be my only exercise pretty much is hydrotherapy. Yeah. So have you heard of RJ Spina? No. He wrote a book called Self-Healing. And oh, I'm yes. actually, I'm, I'm busy reading through it at the moment, but he was saying that he had a, he landed up in hospital. I can't remember what happened, but he was paralyzed from the chest down. Yep. And he also had um, diabetes, uh, pre type 1 diabetes. He had a high blood pressure. He had a whole range of illnesses. He had issues with his colon. And they all said to him, you know, you're never going to walk again, you know, get over it. And he said, I will. And he is now walking. He healed his body. He healed himself. And he teaches people like in a step-by-step -step framework of what mm -hmm. to do, how to meditate, how to put your intention out there as to what it is exactly that you want to do. And it is truly amazing because what he says is very similar to what your angel said. If you make a decision that you want to heal, you cannot go back into the old way and say, yeah, but maybe it won't work. You, you, you have to have one focus. You, you cannot say yes, but you can't waver. You, you can't go back into the yeah. old belief systems and say, yeah, I really want this, but maybe not. Yes, um, I know. I know exactly what you're saying. And I went to Bali and um, I, I, I was looking at the temples over in Bali and I come across a priest in, in one of them. And at the time, I had a cyst in my pancreas. And all I thought about was I'm not going the way my dad went. I don't want to pass away that way. It was bad. So I thought, no way am I going like that. I'd rather die from my heart. Um, so I th that's that was what I was thinking. So I asked to be blessed and for my pancreas to be healed. And it came true. My next CT scan, it was not there. It's never come back. Um, so I thought to myself, gee, I should have been greedy and asked for my heart. But at the I time... I you have both. <laughs> yeah, well, at the time I didn't want to be greedy. And my sister said, why didn't you ask for your heart? And I said, oh, I didn't want to be greedy. So, it's not about um, greedy. <laughs> but now I regret not asking. So this year, at the end of the year, I'm going back there and I'm going to find a priest in the temple and ask for my heart um, so so that I let go of it so that my own brain isn't in in it at all so that somebody else is 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 deciding, not me. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, because what if it is me deciding? You know what I mean? Um, do we decide our own death? I don't well, know. about death? It, do we decide our own health? Well, we do. Uh, uh, yeah, well, we usually do because we usually have a choice, but I'm made up completely different to other people apparently um, because my blood pressure is all wrong as well. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I'm genetically made up a little bit differently health-wise. Um, and so I think to myself that that may be genetic. Also, with my heart, I've I've been thinking, and and this I don't know if this is the right frame of mind or not. Um, where I'm at the point where I think to myself, well, it's my destiny, um, because without this happening, my cardiologist may not find a cure. If if I live and get healed, will they find the cure? Then I've broken the destiny that God chose for me. So that's how I feel. Um, I feel like this is the right destiny. Um, I'm okay with it. I'm totally okay with it. I don't, I got prepared like with um, the career I was in. Um, I talked about death every day to clients um, and it becomes just part of the conversation. So yeah. I was able to and, am, and still am able to just do that about myself. And I think that I was meant to work there. Um, I learned a lot about the secret um, and I started to follow that. I, I sort of read the book before that, but then the companies that I was contracted to believed in that and at seminars you'd hear a lot about it. So. Yeah. Um, I started to really embrace the secret of positive thinking and law of attraction and um, and all of that. And I was healthy, 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 um, nothing wrong until one day um, um, it was before my ride on my push bike, I went to the doctor and I had all these different things wrong with me. And I said, oh, I feel like a hypochondriac. And the doctor said, no, no, you're not. What happens is when you're really, really healthy um, and really active and really fit, your body disguises illnesses until one okay. day it says, I can't do this anymore, and they all come to the surface. And then he goes, that's what's happened to you. Um, and so that wasn't too long prior to the push bike ride. Um so I, I sort of thought to myself, well, that could be true with me because I was very fit. I passed out thousands of times. I knew my heart was stopping, but I couldn't find a cardiologist that could prove that. Yeah. Um, my partner, ex, ex partner, um, would wake me up in the middle of the night. Oh, your heart! I couldn't feel your heart. You know, I thought you were dead. Um, that happened a lot. Um, and he kept saying, oh, your heart stops. And, you know, and I sort of put two and two together um, with me passing out. And my mum, being a nurse, was able to go, you know, like you stopped breathing, you went blue. Um, so in those times that I passed out, something I'll tell you that I've never told anyone um, is when I pass out, I, I'm like, I'm, I go to a different realm. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really strange. It's like I go to a different realm and, I, and I'm a person, I'm me, but I'm meant to be there, um, but in a different world. And so when I do come back through and I'm a, I start to become alert, I still don't know who I am. It takes me, I've got amnesia, um, yeah. maybe for one or two minutes. Um, but I've got to ask, who are you, who are you, for me to know who I am. I need to hear my name. And once I hear my name, I'm okay. Um, but if the person can't explain to me who they are, then I freak out because I, I, I've just come back from a different realm. Um, yeah. Who I was somebody else and living a different life in a different era. And the weird thing is, is it's always like in black and white. 
Um, it's like it's there's no colour to it. That's weird. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that is weird. Well, I mean, I know people have parallel lives, so it would it, you've got to go somewhere. Where do people go when they sleep? We we're not just having a dream. You know, I don't think that yeah. that's just a dream. We all astral yeah. traveling and yes. doing something else. So it could just be that maybe you're just living in two realities at the same time, and maybe that part of you is actually pulling your energy. And mm. um, so yeah, that's you why you're right. having less of it here. Yeah, well, the, you could be onto something there because I now, and when I have a psychic dream, I know I'm having the psychic dream while I'm dreaming it. Yeah. Um, as an example, um, I needed to know what one what was going on with with a boyfriend because he kept ghosting me, and um, all of a sudden his head came towards me in this dream, and I knew it was a psychic dream because it was a head just coming towards me. <laughs> and yeah. he, it didn't fit. No, that wasn't a normal experience. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, this is psychic. That's what's going on. Um, and I knew that it was a mate that had passed, and that's the only detail I was given. And but the message was everything's okay, and that was it. That was it. That was the message. And I was like, oh, geez, that, is that it? You know. Yes. And and um, that was like in my dream. I'm thinking that, um, and it, it came to be true. And another time, the one that freaked me out the most was. Um, I had a friend and um, he came to me in my dream and I knew it was a psychic dream and he didn't really say much um, but he walked around the house I was renting from him um, and he's walking around the house but then he walked around the yard and he had a mental illness and he was throwing, he was a plumber and he was throwing every tiny thing into the gardens and I dug it all out, like pipes, anything you used for plumbing was in those gardens, even sinks, you name it. And um, <laughs> so I pulled them all out to fix the gardens up and that was the deal that I looked after and fixed the house up. Um, so I'd done all that and and then he got to the backyard and in my dream I'm thinking, this cannot be happening, you're not dead. Why are you here? You can't do this. You're not dead. And that's all I could think in my dream. And I knew it was a psychic dream, just that he's not dead. How are you doing this? And so he got to the end of the back of the yard and he just stood there and looked down and looked at me and then he was gone. Um, so I, I, I think he was just checking out his place. That was it. Um, so it would have been a few days later I got a phone call from his mum. He had passed away. Um oh. So he, so as soon as he passed away, he had come to me um, in that dream. So I, I woke up the next day thinking that that kind of happened. You, how did he do that? You know, he's not dead. No, no, no. I would have heard, no, he's not dead. And um, it sort of played on my mind. So when she rang, I was not surprised with what she said. Um, so he did die around exactly where the time he come to me in that dream. He did come to me a few times when I was doing psychic readings. Um, he would, um, where I was doing them in this room, um, he would come and sit behind me and watch me and I'd always tell him to go away. So, <laughs> I can't watch, go away. So... <laughs> And he thought it was a joke. That was his sense of humour and um, just to play with me a bit where I have to say, go away. So, yeah. Um, interesting so people, interesting people, uh, thing to go and bury things in your garden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think he sort of gave up on the garden. It's like, oh, it looks wonderful. Thing, thing, thanks for that. <laughs> um, and now I'll just go and sit you and watch you do the reading. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I found that really, really funny that he would do that. Um, other times he would start the vacuum cleaner and I heard from his sister he had a thing about vacuuming all the time. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's why I kept turning it on. Um, <laughs> so, But I always knew it was him doing it. So, But I didn't know for sure until the sister said, yeah. 
Yeah, jeez. Mm. So where could people get hold of you if they want to um, get a reading or just, yep. you know, chat to you? Yeah, um, I'm on, I, I've got a page and a, um, and a group. Um, so the group's private, so because of, because of the readings. Um, so um, it's called Somewhere Over the Rainbow, All Things Positive and Psychic. Um, so that we don't do negative um, in the group or page because we have enough of that in our real life, you know. So yeah. um, I like to help people bring out their own abilities um, and so there's no negative um, feedback. So yeah. it's all positive feedback and, and we all encourage one another um, with with each other's abilities. Um, so um, they should be able to go into the page and press on message and that will send um, me a message. They'll get an automated message saying, hi, da, 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 I'm away at the moment. Um, but then I come on. So um, I do my readings through there. Now, because I'm the only person who does those readings, I do have a big long list. Of, uh, so there is a little bit of a wait, um, but I'm more than happy within the group as well. If you go into the group, there's always a group chat going on. Um, and you can always ask for a reading because there's other psychics in the group. Um, and they might find, I find... Um, people uh, um, find different psychics for a reason. They will come across them, the right one that's right for them. Um, yeah. And I'm not always right for everybody. Um, and so they've got to feel right with with with, the, with that person before they ask for a reading. Um, I've never had any issues, by the way, but <laughs> I just that's something I just feel that... Um, we need you need that oh drawn to one another and I'm pretty much drawn to every single person who asks for a reading. Um <laughs> I just can't help myself but do one for them. Um sometimes um I will point out with the readings I tend to because I ask for their guide to come forward um to help me with the reading um I will go with whatever I'm told to tell them. It's not always the it's not always the answer to their question. Um, I get that a lot with myself as well. So um, and it can be frustrating. It just yeah. means you need another reading further down the track. Um, and I know how frustrating it is because it happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> like your last message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was that it? Yes, that was yeah. it. <laughs> and yeah, and yeah. even I mean your family needs you too. Yo, what does that mean? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, that's me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but so, um, other people, I'm pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, and that's also the thing, you know, like say, they say psychics can read for everyone else but not for themselves. And and maybe yes. that's a good thing because you can't really you're not going to live life if, if it's all been laid out for you. You're not going to. No, that's right. Um, I don't live my life by my cards at all. Um, I will read my cards when I feel a need to. I, if I feel like even with um, guidance with my spirituality, you know, like um, so I've got so many different types of cards and types of readings. Um, but as for a day-to-day no, I do more these things. So they're affirmations. Okay. So, yeah, so I'll shuffle and see what, what cards, and I've got a few up there, um, what card is right for me for today. Um, so a lot rather than doing a reading. But if I do do a reading for myself, I do like my older sister to be there with me. Um, because she keeps me on track because I'll go, oh, that card means this. And she goes, no, Rhonda, it means this. And I go, oh, <laughs> yeah, it does. You know, that makes more sense, you know. So <laughs> it is harder to read your own cards, very hard to read for friends and family um, because they're the, the best critics. 
so that therefore you should practice with your friends and family um, because they are your best critics. They're going to give you positive feedback but also criticism where necessary. So um, I, I find that really, that's how I started. And yeah. it, it, it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do you have a message for obvious? Um, I think just uh, with what I um, come back from, from having these unconditional love, if we can try and embrace that in our lives with our own family to start off with and branch out from there and, you know, like be forgiving, don't be so judgmental. Um, God is the only judge and he doesn't judge. So how can we judge? Um, just love, just just always love. And I think that that's the biggest message that I can give is not just love but unconditionally. So that means coming straight from your heart um, and no matter what that person does or says, you will always love them. And you do that with family and friends, right? We can do it with <laughs> other people, all the strangers we meet. Oh, sorry, you dropped your bag. Here you go. I'll help you. Unconditional love, you know, just helping people and, and you know, like I... I can't do it with everyone. <laughs> um, it, you know, that's impossible. We're not, we're not, we're human. We're human. So yeah. um, how we love our babies when we love, you know, have, have a baby, we, it's unconditional love. And I think they come into the world with unconditional love. Let's keep it that way with our babies. Because yeah. maybe the future will change then. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome. And uh, also, I mean, I think it's hard. It's easy with strangers because you don't have a persona built around them. When it comes to family, they push your buttons. And mm. it's very hard to react to the button because you think to yourself, here yeah, they go again. <laughs> mm. And, and and it is it is that, and I think that's where it starts. If you're able to do that with your family, and they start feeling that, whether they do or don't, in the end, doesn't matter. Because if you can do it with people that trigger you, you can do it with anybody. That's right, and I think that that doesn't mean that you you allow people to abuse you or um, toxic, keeping toxic people in your life. Absolutely. So I think that I think for you to be able to love unconditionally is to get rid of all the toxic people in your life um, because you're not going to be able to, like you mentioned earlier, you know, like to love unconditionally, you can't do that when you've got your hammer down. And yeah. if you're around to toxic people, that there's a vibe that, that, that basically jumps from them to you yeah. and you'll walk away with that negativity. You're taking it home to your family and, um, and I think the, one of the most important things to do is to smudge. Um, yeah. So, yep, yeah, to, to make sure, but also to cleanse. But cleanse your home, cleanse outside of your home, cleanse yourself um, of all negativity. And there's different ways to get rid of it. People say, but I suffer depression. That's fine. I understand that because I've suffered it as well. So to get yourself out of that hole is, number one, surrender to God and say, help yeah. me, help me. And so a lot of people say, but I have a lot of negative thoughts. Um, everyone does, you know, like we're all human. So I put a band on my wrist and I would flick it every time I had a negative thought. And every time you flick it, you turn that negative into a positive or just forget it or com completely, you know. Yeah. And that's a reminder um, so you can, there's lots of little things you can do to, to ch change how you think and yeah. everything in life's a choice like we, we said and um, we can choose to be negative or we can choose to be positive 
And that's not the easiest thing in life, let me tell you, because we've thrown lots of things at us, uh, left, right and centre, so that, oh, yeah, look at her, she's now a negative. You know, we're all going to have our good and bad days. But don't be so hard on yourself because we're yeah. not perfect. Well, so we were love is perfect. Well, lo love is loving yourself too. It's not absolutely. loving others. <laughs> Yeah, but absolutely, you've got to love yourself before you can love other people because it love because love comes from your heart within. So so you have to love within yourself, and that took me many years, many 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 years, <laughs> yeah, um, to work that out and to to realize I don't need people to love me um, because if I love myself, I've got everything. I've got the unconditional love to be able to share to you, you and you and everybody else around me. Um, but the only way for me to be able to do that is to love myself. And there's days you don't, you know, like you look in the mirror and go, oh, look at my hair today, you know. So, <laughs> um, you know, that's an example, silly example. But, um, you know, we all do it. We all have our, we, but the thing is we can be so hard on ourselves and go, look, you just failed. No, we didn't fail. We just try again, try again, try again, try again until we get it. Yeah, and, exactly. and that's how you change how you think too. Yeah. And uh, I think, that, um, like you said, just get rid of all the toxic people out of your life and um, and move on to, to positivity and, and say that's a choice and say that's what I choose in life. Yeah, um, yeah. So you're spot on. Thank you, Rhonda, so much for sharing your story. I really enjoyed hearing you, and um, I agree. I think we've all got some sort of affliction that is what gets you to that higher space. It kind of it's kind of bridging the gap between being human and being spirit, and bringing the two together. You know, absolutely. Um, the way you explain that, I really love that. Um, because it's so true with what you're saying, you know, like we go through transitions to get to there, to, to be enlightened, and then you think you're enlightened, but then there's more enlightenment. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that enlightenment doesn't seem to end. Um, we're always learning, and that's the nature of our brain, I think. Yeah. Is yeah. It, it's, it's programmed to learn. So Absolutely. we're always learning about ourselves, you know, because, you know, people might point out to you, oh, you're like this or you're like that. You're like, Am I? You know, <laughs> but that, gives you, <laughs> that gives you a moment to say, well, I can change that, you know, that's a negative thing. So and other times it's, it could be really positive and, and it's like, am I? You still, And it's still really a positive thing that they've said, but you have to believe it. You know, yeah. and that can be the hardest thing is believing in yourself as well. That's a little bit different to unconditional love, but it sort of falls in, in there. You know, yeah. I feel no, like unconditional love has branches, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's all of it. It's everything. Yeah. It's your yeah. belief systems, your your body, your health, yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I've learned something tonight. That's for certain. <laughs> um, I'll be reading that book. Um, so yeah. I've written it down. Self healing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Self healing. Uh, he's got a he's yeah. got a, a YouTube channel as well. I'll send you the link. Um, oh, in fact, okay, I'll just post it on the links below because then everybody can yeah, yeah. can find yeah, him as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that'd be awesome because I love reading. So and I love reading spiritual books because that's how you grow. Um, yeah. 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 Well, the thing is, he was told he'll never recover. And, and he said, I will. And he did. Well, and he's I was told through. I was never going surfing again. So I said, yes, I will. I just won't yeah. be able to surf my little short board. I'll just go and get a longer board. And so yeah. I, I did. I went and bought that board. And I'm waiting to, for a nice, perfect little day, and I mean little, where I can go out and just paddle around and catch one wave if i catch one wave i'll be stoked you know because <laughs> i'll awesome. say 
I'll say when I'm going to stop surfing, not you, um, yeah. because it's my life and and sometimes you just have to change the way you're doing it. I always said also, I wouldn't ride a longboard, but I'm going to ride a little bit longer than what I'm riding, so used to riding. Yeah. So. Well, if it's going to make you feel alive and, and make yeah. you fit and healthy, well, then let it mask all the symptoms. That was that worked then. Why wouldn't it work now? Absolutely. I, that's a, you know, and I've started to think like that, exactly like that, like you're saying, um, of recent and starting to live again and I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this. I was going to go on a slingshot, um, you know, <laughs> get slinged up into the air the other day. I was on a holiday <laughs> and um, the big sign says no heart conditions and I walked away like with my tail between my legs because I was like so disappointed you know, that I couldn't go on it because of the heart condition. And I thought to myself, do I fake it? And, and they don't know, you know, and still go on it. Um, and I just couldn't make my mind up what the right choice was, so I walked away. Um, yeah, so <laughs> but I'm at the point where I'm going, nothing's going to stop me anymore. You know, like I'm going to do what I want to do and go surfing, and I'll say when I have the last surf. Um, yeah. and even if it's just paddling around and then I'll go, okay, I can't do that anymore. And then I'll go, okay, that's it. Um, you know what <laughs> the doctors, the doctors want to tell you don't do it because they don't want to be, um, at fault, at risk if something does happen. So Absolutely. they will err on the side of caution, but it doesn't mean that that's you right. can't do it just because they suggest it or say it because they're just covering themselves. You know, I used to teach yes. uh, classes and I had a student who, she came to me with a doctor's letter and she said she can't do certain moves. I used to teach pole dancing. I can't do this move because it's pulling on my hamstring and it's causing problems. And I said to her, this is not, you can do it. This is not even affecting your hamstring. I said, but let me, tell me, tell me what's going on at home. And she was in a very abusive relationship. And I said to her, you actually have back problems lower back problems, and everything's pulling tight because of the stress. I said, what you should actually be doing is not going to see a, um, a physio because they were putting their elbow into her, into her bum to try and massage it. I said, all they're doing is bruising it. I said, what you actually need to do is go for a hot stone massage and go and relax so that your body can untense because the hamstring's being pulled tight because the back's being pulled tight. I said, the right. worst that could happen is you could actually fall asleep and have a nice massage. Do you know that she actually, it did, it worked so well for her that she did the hot stone massage course and became a masseuse. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Because that's interesting because I have a really bad back um, and neck. So when the tree came down, I broke my neck and I walked yes. around with a broken neck for six, seven years. Um, because yeah, I th I thought they were wrong, but it was broken. Um, and so I had this operation where they went in through the front during COVID, and um, so I was in a wheelchair and with a cane. They now have to do that operation again because the fuse didn't take. So they did a yeah. bone graft on my hip and put it in my neck. I had lost an inch. I was happy to get my inch back, so that <laughs> that part I was happy about. Um, but I know what I'm in for, and that's happening pretty soon. And I'm thinking maybe if I just go and lay in these stones, they can do a CT and they go, oh, she's got no back problem anymore. And and what it mine's from is doing gymnastics um, yeah. when I was young. It's a very common back problem with gymnasts apparently. Yeah. So, well, yeah. the thing is, we have a blueprint for our body in perfect health. And if you can tap into that blueprint and pull that energy through, I've heard miracles. I've heard a lot of people that have recovered from, I mean, one of the ladies I interviewed, she had also a genetic disorder and she was mm -hmm. totally healed, totally healed from yep. a near-death experience where, where it's not even possible to heal from. Well, I'll tell you now, when you started telling me about, is it RJ or JR? RJ Spina. Yeah, RJ, RJ Spina, I'm yeah. RJ as well, so that's why I thought I might have had that wrong. Um, but anyway, when you were saying about how he, how he was paralysed, he was diabetic. My dad 
was playing with us in the swimming pool and he got paralysed. My mum, who's only five foot two, I'm five foot one, she's five foot two, she just pulled him out with one arm and my dad was a big man and had the strength to do that. Um, he was rushed to Sydney Hospital um, and he stayed there for quite a few years, paralysed. But he prayed in the church that he was going to, prayed. And he also had diabetes. And wow. so they were praying for both. And he was healed for both in the one hit. And yep. he was able to come home. And But we all thought that was it. He was going to be in a wheelchair no. for the rest of Life. I've just got goosebumps now. You prayed just for the pancreas. You could you could so have done too. <laughs> I know. I, I, I say that. And, and you don't need to go only, to, you don't need to go there to Malaysia to do I that. Know. I know. I think I need that symbol. You know how some people just need that symbol of, of Yeah. Um, I agree. It's the yeah. outward expression it's, and the actual yeah. ceremony it's ritual. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And um, I definitely was planning on going there this year, and definitely going. I'm going back to that temple, and I'm asking for the heart to be healed, and um, a miracle could happen. And um, I just have to believe it. And a friend of mine makes me think of this. A very close friend of mine I, um, I've had for many years. A few years back, she gave me a few little things to stick on my fridge, and this one, she goes on, this one um, is the re for the reason that and she'd have a reason. And they're all, all little sayings. And this one I, I just feel compelled to give you. I don't know why, but here it is. And it says, believe in miracles. And <laughs> I still have that on my fridge to this day. So, yeah. um, and I do believe in miracles. So do I believe that I deserve a miracle? That's the question, I think, that I need to ask myself. So do I deserve it? You know, like that's usually what stops someone from moving forward with something like this. And that's yeah. self-love again. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So... <laughs> That's oh, part wow. of, you, I think, awesome. why we're here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you're really on the right page. Yeah, you're right there, you know, like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I could well, learn a that's lot why we do know. this journey. Yes. We, well, yes. that's the thing, right? It's like we've all experienced traumas and we've all had our own learnings and I learned so much too. And with every you know, book I read and yeah. a realization I have, a person I speak to, yeah. it, it grows and it helps, hopefully will help to grow everybody else as well. Even if it's just yeah. one, one story, one idea that can make somebody's life change, you know. I know, that's, that's what it. I think too. I've had feedback from some of my readings where they've told me that and, um, you know, they, they, they don't always come back for readings. Um, it doesn't mean they don't, it's because they don't need them, you know, and, you know, and say, you know, the biggest one was somebody said they, uh, you know, I had to say, oh, they asked if they could should move. And I'm thinking, oh, what if I'm wrong? You know, because <laughs> you if you let doubt in, you're not going to get it right. Um, yeah. You've got to stay in tune and not let doubt in, and, but it creeps in. And mm -hmm. that's a big thing on my shoulders. If she moves and I'm wrong. You know, and she's picking up kids and changing his job. And anyway, it come to me that he he wouldn't need to change his job. He's a truckie. I said, he's a truckie, isn't he? And she said, yes. I said, well, he won't need to change his job and, yes, move. Um, in a bit more detail than that. I do go into a lot of detail, actually. Um, and so they did that. And um, a year or so down the track, Thank you so much. And I'm still friends with her now. She lives in America. And, you know, so I don't usually befriend people, you know, through the page and group, but this person that stood out and, yeah. So I'm still yeah. friends with her. Yeah. Well, you can't get it wrong anyway because 
it's again like your path. If I go right, I see this. If I go left, I see this. Is is one right no. and one wrong? No. Well, <laughs> I, well, I don't know about that. Well, I would say not the case because quite often people are on a good path. So well, why you can't do really both. No, that's right. You can't do both. It's basically just showing you if you go this way, this is what happens. Well, I if mean, you stay where you, you are. Know. This is what happens. You know, so exactly right. If you went then, east, you'd go to America, and if you went west, you'd come to South Africa. And so, is one right and one wrong? No, the one is just over there, I, and the one's over there. Which one do you exactly want to do right, right now? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a very good scenario. I like that. How you put that? That's really good because um yeah it's just like call it, calling everything black and white and yes, you the um, <laughs> yeah but there's not only black and white there's gray there's you know like tan there's all shades of, there's 50 shades of gray <laughs> uh, yes there is <laughs> apparently <laughs> so yeah um, yeah, we've just got to, like, we really need to balance our life too. And that's a, and a message I would say to people too is to balance your life. Don't overdo it with work um, or with any obsession. I wouldn't say passion. I'd say obsession um, and because you should always do your passion. But I think with you, if it's an obs obsession, you know, wean back on it and balance your life a little bit more. Um, and that's a hard thing to do also um, if you and, and ground yourself. And, and the only way to do that is get out in the garden or put your feet in the grass, you know, barefoot, you know, yeah. um, and that's the best way to ground yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> that was great. Uh -huh. you, you have an awesome yeah. evening. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, you know, it's been a pleasure to speak with you and get to know you that little bit. And, yeah, yeah. You, you give off a beautiful aura. You're like, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Nice. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, maybe by the time I – you're going into winter as well, so maybe by the time yes. I load the video, you will have been on your surfboard. <laughs> yes, and I will definitely let you know. Um, when I do, I'm, I'm, because I could go out now, but it doesn't matter when I go out, I always wear a steamer because um, I'm always cold. Um, as soon as that breeze hits when I'm wet, I'll get cold in every oh, yeah. summer. Yeah, I'm one oh, of those yeah. people. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I quite often wear a steamer, which is the long wetsuit, you know, like full body. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah, so I'm going to get out there very soon. Very, very <laughs> I think it's better than a slingshot. It's a, it's a safer bet for now. Well, I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to start yeah. off slow. <laughs> so the slingshot was very high in the sky, I must say, because um, where we were staying, you could see it going higher than the floor we were on. And we we're like, whoa, that's pretty high. And then we w went up close. But you're looking at the video of their faces, so you're not really paying attention to how high it is. But you can see a video well, of their faces, which was quite hysterical. So <laughs> well, the thing is, like your mind could maybe handle it, but if you if you get uh, tachycardia from that from that car accident and you haven't recovered, yes. your body's on high alert. So it's not about yes. what your mind thinks; it's more about can your body cope with that that kind of stress. That's exactly right. That, yeah, and that's why I think that's why I said to myself, "No, don't do it," um, yeah. because you know my mind. And I found that a lot to start off with um, when I couldn't work in that. Um, I just got sicker and sicker because as you get older, it gets worse. Um, yeah. And I shouldn't have been past thirty. Um, so I'm really thankful that I have and quite a bit past 30, I will let you know. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm really, I feel really privileged for that alone, you know, so having all these extra years. Yeah. Um, and I look at people and there's so many people more worse off than I am. Yeah, so I, I spend a lot of time down in hospital where, I meet people and, you know, I've met so many friends and they've got lost their legs or, you know, like they're in hospital for eight months of the year 
um, yeah. going through kidney dialysis every single day, I think people like that for me are a lot worse off than I am. Yeah. So um, I've, I think myself very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Rather, rather than, than seeing it as, you know, because as soon as you think of yourself in a negative way, you're just making yourself feel worse. And, you sh and, and, and that's like focusing on the fear. That's focusing yes. on the pie, on the fire and focusing on the lions. And you don't want to go that's there. It. So why, no, why focus on it? It no, is there exactly if you want right. to go there. <laughs> but I don't want to. So, yeah, I'm quite happy where I am. <laughs> I might yeah. stay on this side of the path. Um, yeah, because um, I think also with my grandmother asking her before she passed away, I didn't know it was going to be the last time I spoke with her, but it was. I said to her, what's the secret to life? And she said, always keep a sense of humour. And, yeah. and I think there's something in that, you know, laughter is the best medicine, they say, and I agree with that. So that can heal the body too. Absolutely. So, yeah, so it's a matter of, you know, laughing in the bad times is the, is the hardest part, you know, but we yeah. all, we all go, go through that, or well, 90% of us do. Um, and... Yeah, getting through that and saying, well, I, it's a choice now. I can laugh or I can cry. So I choose to laugh because it's a lot more fun. So yeah. um, I, I much prefer to laugh than cry. I, I did end up crying in my first half of my life. So, and I said, that's it, no more. Um, I'm going to start laughing and smiling and, and being happy. Yeah. But yeah. it took her to say that to me as well, so it changed my life in a little bit of a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just need to hear that. Yeah, but I, yeah. like I said, like we said, it's a it's a choice, and you can cry yeah. if you want. Sometimes yeah. you think, well, I just want to cry. Leave me alone. <laughs> yes, I'm that's now. right. I have those <laughs> days. I don't get me wrong. I most definitely do have those days. I tend to try and time them when there's no one around. Um, so then I have to don't have to deal with why are you crying? You know, so just yeah, like you say, just let us cry. Um, so yeah, sometimes we do need a good cry. That's why we've got tears. That's it. So yeah, yeah leave me alone. I'm crying. Get over yourself. <laughs> you wanna cry, you can cry. If you don't want to, that's that's on you. Yeah, that's right. And it's like watching a sad movie, isn't it? And you're laying down and you've got the tears rolling and you look over at your sister or your, your friend and see whether they're crying as well. And quite often they are, but it's, it's most of it, we're all hiding our tears, you know, like, come on, let's <laughs> <It's terrible. go. laughs> Exactly. Oh, anyway. Okay. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, enjoy your evening. Um, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. Really awesome to meet you. Yeah, and likewise. I look forward to following you. Yes. <laughs> Thank mm. you. Bye bye. Bye. Um.